Good evening. Today is September 12th, 2024. I'd like to call this meeting of the Auburn City Council to order. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Councillor Kent. Here. Councillor Overstreet Wilson. Here. Councillor Cuddy. Here. Councillor Calarco. Here. Mayor Genetino. Here. Please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silent prayer or reflection. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, pu public announcements? No announcements this evening. We'll be moving on to a ceremony we have this evening for Auburn Little League. Um, I'd like to read some background that was provided to us by Coach Ruscio. The journey for Auburn All-Stars started locally at their home field for the district pool play. Auburn's team was rostered by 10 out of 13 players at 12 years old that will not be returning next year. Auburn was the number one seed going to Geneva in tournament play where they beat Lakeshore and then South Cuga in a championship game 11 to nothing. In districts, Auburn outscored opponents 75 to three. In the sectionals, they beat Big Flats 11 to zero and we won against Maine Endwell 12 to two, which is a team that usually makes it to states and won the Little League World Series in 2016. This gave them the opportunity to play the championship game with no losses. Then they played Beeville, which Auburn lost 5-4. They were able to redeem themselves with a 7-6 win, which led to their New York State Championship in Staten Island. In Staten Island, the players were excited and treated like professional ball players. They started off beating Penfield 9-4 and then Plattsburgh 5-3. They were 2-0 going into the final pool play game, where they lost to Harrison 1-0. To Auburn made the final four in the state going against the home team South Shore. Auburn played a great game but fell short and lost 6-0. Overall, they ended third in New York State out of 1,300 teams and 49th in the country. This team played with all they had and it was a great experience. They were overwhelmed with the amazing support from the community. Holes for Hope's famous lemonade stand raised money that helped offset costs for traveling to Staten Island. They can't thank the community enough for all the support cheering us on and this was definitely a memory that the players will have for a lifetime. As I mentioned, this was prepared by Coach Ruscio. Uh, gentlemen, on behalf of the City Council, myself, the entire City of Auburn, congratulations. Thank you for representing the City of Auburn in such a positive way. Congratulations on a tremendous season. These statistics are, are, are fantastic and you should be proud of yourselves. At this time, I'm going to come down to the center rail, and uh, City Clerk will. I can do an alphabetical. Order. Yeah. He's going to call the names in alphabetical order, and we'll have you come up and receive your certificate. So we will start with uh, Cohen Ashby. <laughs> Landon Blanchfield. Bo Buchanan, Evan Beulah, Lucas Fitzgerald, Tanner Garino Oliver, Bentley Lanning. Camden Murinka, <laughs> Seth Portapillo, <laughs> Gio Ruscio, <laughs> Parker Smith, <laughs> Joseph Villano. Zalbin. Yeah, before uh, the players leave, we'll, 
We'll uh, have you come up as a team, please, with your coaches, and we'll get a picture with the mayor and the council. So we'll take a 10 minute recess. Call us back into session. Move on to the public to be heard. At this point in time, we'll open the public to be heard portion of the council meeting. Residents are asked to state their name and address for the record. Please keep remarks to three minutes or less, and please observe commonly accepted rules of courtesy and decorum. Thank you. Is there anybody wishing to be heard this evening? Ms. Manners, either podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it working? Yeah. My name is Erica Manners. I reside at 126 Franklin Street here in Auburn. Um, I'll be honest, uh, the moment I knew I was going to stand up here, I felt my heart sink. Sometimes standing up for what's right comes at a steep price, especially in a small town like this one, and I'd be lying if I said I'm not afraid. But if I sat here in silence, then I'd be no better than some of those whom I'm speaking on today. And if I sat here in silence, then I'd have to sleep at night 10 years from now in fear for my children and what they may encounter because mom didn't stand up when she had the chance. So that's why I'm here now. I've known that police brutality and abuse of power has gone on around the world for years, but to know it so close to you shakes you to the core. To be sitting next to your lifelong friend and cutting up his bread into bite-sized pieces because he can't open his mouth wide enough to eat because his jaw bones have been broken by the very hands that have been meant to protect him. It really puts things into another perspective. Listening to his son say things like, Daddy, I won't hug you too hard because I don't want you to have to go back to the hospital. The way that tiny voice becomes engraved in your head. 
the thing about police brutality is that somehow they always manage to find some way to justify it. They always stick together, beside each other, defending each other's actions. And I'll never understand how the same very officers who stood up in front of our young minds preaching to us the importance of things like the D.A.R.E. program, of sticking up for ho those who need it, teaching us that if you see something, say something, teaching us wrong from right, and who to call when we need help, turning around and being the same people who hurt us, and how somehow we have to be the ones to fight for our own justice when they do. I guess I just can't for the life of me understand how it takes a village, but that same village is the one taking us one by one and breaking us and claiming it to be justified. Is there truly no other way? Is de-escalation no longer a tactic? Does accountability only apply to those who do not have a badge? Is this truly what it means to protect and serve? I have to wonder. Is this brotherhood so strong that even knowing in your heart what's right and what's wrong isn't enough to break it, to make any one of you stand up and say stop? Instead, they all just sit there and watch. And now we have to watch as our loved ones struggle to heal heal from the very hands hired to protect them, but instead they chose to protect their egos, they chose to protect their toxic masculinity, they chose pride in a personal punching bag. Does your anger run so deep that breaking the bones of the people on the streets becomes your new therapy? Do you feel better now? I'd ask you, Mr. Tough Guy, do you feel good about yourself now? But I think that I already know the answer and unfortunately I know that they're proud of you too. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there anybody else wishing to be heard? Oh. Good afternoon. I am the Stowe Street, DeAndre's grandfather. And like this lady was speaking, we have too much going on in Auburn. Um, my grandson, 14 years old, and they dogs him like that. What can we do about it? Not a thing. Like the slater was saying, you're sweeping under the rug. We don't have officers. We don't have police. We have cops. You know? They cops. They wait. We go to bed at night. We don't know when we're going to wake up in the morning when our kids are dead. We're going to have to stop it one way or the other. So it's going to be up to them. I don't care whether they make a target or what. I'm going to speak my piece. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Cherry Love Duncan. I live at 92 Clark Street, Auburn, New York. It's a shame to grow up in a city and live here all your life. And then newcomers come in and you bring newcomers in. You never research on these cops that you hire to protect us. We don't have any protection. Even if our kids use a phone to record what is going on with a cop, they get harassed when they find out that that video has been taken. They call their jobs and say that they're going to have or they're to fire people that have taken videos of their wrongdoing. They harass the young black men on the streets, even if they're just standing on the streets. But yet two feet from these young black men is four white boys doing some of everything. I've been into the courtroom here in Auburn, and I've even, even taken notes. I've seen where there's a black young man and there's a white young man involved in committing the same crime. I've watched the white boy get patted in the back, and I've seen the black boy go to prison for four years. Where is that equal justice? Is it because your skin is lighter than ours? Well, let me tell you something about that skin you're wearing. You're not a white man. I'm not a black woman. I'm a human being just like you are. Our children are human beings. All you're doing is in this city is causing a whole lot of trouble, a whole lot of tears, 
and we will not stand for it no more. We're going to keep coming. We're going to keep going to the different news stations. We're going to go and we're going to come until somebody hears us. Thank you. So this weekend, my 14-year-old child was injured by an Auburn police officer. He was injured in the foyer at Wegmans. Can, can you just state your name and address for oh, the record, I'm sorry. please? Deborah Overstreet, 4 Steel Street, Auburn, New York. Thank you. Um, he was injured in the foyer at Wegmans here in Auburn. I was called down to the scene as he is a minor and it is his right to have a parent there. At this time, I am supposed to tell you my baby isn't perfect. Nobody's 14-year-old minor is, but nothing he did justified being injured and thrown against a police car. My son is 5'11 and weighs 140 pounds. When I reached Wegmans, my son was in the back of a police car. There was blood all over and he was in handcuffs. The blood was from his mouth that was bleeding profusely from being slammed on his face by this grown man. He asked to spit the blood out and the officers refused to open the door. They would not open it all the way so that I could see him and they said this was because he was spitting on them. They did not give my 14-year-old minor an option to rid his mouth of the blood other than the floor of the police car. They were setting my son up. I was told that the police officer at Wegmans slammed my 14-year-old child on the ground. This is what could have caused his teeth to go through his lip. I was told that when he was moved from the foyer to the police car, the same officer rammed him into different objects that lined that area, and when they arrived to the car, he was slammed against it twice from what he recalls. I was not told my son was being arrested, but that he was being detained and his rights were not read. Um, the brutalizing of my son continued after he was transported to the Auburn ER, where I was forced to watch another grown man beat up my son at the hospital. It was as if I was watching a gang destroy his innocence. I was helpless, scared, angry, and just broken. All I could do was stand and watch. Thank you. Tracy Aikens, Curtis Police, Auburn. Um, I'm here speaking on ha behalf of my cousin, Justin Overstreet, and also myself, because I have lived here my whole life as the elder of this next generation coming up. I raised five kids here and worked with OMH, OCFS for many, many years. I have an understanding of child endangerment, child protective, all of it. And what I have seen these last three weeks in our town is ridiculous. I've seen a little girl thrown by a police officer across a parking lot protecting her. No, that's not protecting her. Protecting her is not seeing what she saw and raising another generation that is afraid of our police officers. But on behalf of my cousin Justin Overstreet, the father of DeAndre, have any of you ever had to watch another grown man beat your child up? Have any of you had to listen to police officers scream out lies to justify their brutality? Have any of you ever cried yourself to sleep because you were powerless to protect your child? I have. I feel like a fa failure and all I can do is wonder if the mayor, city councilor, city manager will finally address the attitudes and behavior and control the APD. At the ER, the blood kept pooling in my son's mouth, and my wife asked for a bag or garbage pail several times before she was given one. She was ignored both by APD and ER staff. The blood was spit on the floor so as not to swallow. Finally, one of the nurses got a bag, and when she turned to reach for it, at the exact time, the aggressive officer grabbed my son, jacked him up, and rammed him against the wall while he was shouting, don't spit on me. He was lying and it was an excuse to manhandle my son. My son then was brought back into a room where he was slammed on a bed with his hands and feet cuffed. At this point, I was pushed out of the room and into the hallway. My wife and I were told we needed to leave and go up front to fill out paperwork. With him being in a minor and the abuse we already witnessed, we refused. After this, my son was cuffed to a bed so tight that his hands turned numb. 
This behavior must be acceptable. Not once did any of the other officers physically flinch or show a grimace in their facial expressions to show this behavior was hurting to them. They were all comfortable with my child being treated worse than an animal. Three black people have been beat up by the APD in the last few weeks, and not one of you have addressed it. Black kids in the city are not safe from the brutality of the APD or the excuses made by the supervisors. Black kids in the city are not safe from brutality of the APD or the excuses made by the supervisors. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Josh Overstreet and I live at 30 Sheridan Street here in Auburn. Debbie is my sister-in-law and Justin is my brother. The minor they are talking about is my nephew. I work with people diagnosed with disabilities and mental health. What I'm witnessing from these police officers is the lack of emotional control and the lack of skill to self-regulate their physical anger response. Auburn has a problem on their hands. The police department has mandates, policies, procedures, and, the govern, and govern your operations. Follow them. Instead of being deceitful, telling lies, covering up, and just blatantly being defiant to the law that you swore to uphold. Your responsibility to this community is to protect, serve, and not terrorize and traumatize. I now have to tell my son and daughters, brothers, and my father to be careful when they are driving or out in town because the APD cannot be trusted. The sad fact is the entire community, unless you wear that uniform, live up past Hoops Park, or are related to them. We are all in harm's way. If three black people have been beaten up in the past few weeks, what's next? Does someone have to die before you understand that this is a crisis we are in? Thank you. Good, after mayor, good afternoon, Mayor, Councilors and city manager, city clerk. My name is Gwen Weber McLeod. I live at 27 Thornton Avenue here in Auburn, New York. I've been really observing and monitoring these situations over a period of time and I feel compelled to speak for a couple of reasons. Because professionally, I am a DEI strategist who works with law enforcement leaders across the state on balancing the responsibility of supporting officers they lead holding them accountable for their actions and keeping them safe on the job while simultaneously being equally responsible for ensuring communities they serve receive fair, equitable treatment from officers in their respective departments. My clients, these law enforcement officers, are committed to this important work and strive daily to do their work in partnership with other leaders. But I also want to tell you that I'm also the mother, grandmother, bonus mom and mentor to black girls, boys, men, and women, some of these young people are in this room today. And for the purposes of my comments, I want to focus on this. Daily, I balance encouraging my beloved sons to view law enforcement officers as a community resource paid for by their tax dollars, while simultaneously aggressively teaching them what could happen should they be confronted by the wrong officer at the wrong moment for simply living while black. It is important to understand this data supported fact. From birth, every aspect of a black boy's life is restrained, and we are restraining our sons to keep them with one singular goal, keeping them alive. Don't walk too fast on the east end. Don't run anywhere in public. Don't drive in certain areas. No, you can't go for a jog on the east end because I don't know who's going to be afraid of you. Don't make eye contact. Don't talk in a tone that a law enforcement officer could perceive as disrespectful. Dear God, please don't don't let my sons fit the description. Their lives are full of don't, don't, don't in a city where we as their parents pay taxes for this police force. I cannot describe the emotional mental toll this takes on people. These situations are triggering and they remind me of Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. It intrigues me that 
most the most prevalent response to situations like this is for law enforcement to take a defensive posture. My clients rely on policies, don't allow poor behavior or, or, or be general or allow their officers to be generalized. But they do hold officers accountable for doing the right thing. And it's my experience professionally that taking this approach yields enhanced training, better screening of retoots, and better attitudes. It shouldn't be that hard to do because in the United States of America there is 400 years of documented evidence and related research to look for for answers. There are many law enforcement officers across our state looking to address these issues in partnerships with community leaders. And we have one shared goal. We are committed leaders making it eminently clear in word, deed, and action that we believe this one thing to be true. It is the birthright of every citizen in the city of Auburn, New York, to be equally protected under the law, kept safe, valued, and respected as citizens coexisting in this community. What we choose to do next as a city really matters, and I'm hoping these comments open hearts, challenge assumptions, and expand minds. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Clerk, and anyone else I might have missed, good evening. For weeks now, I've stood here at this desk to represent the NAACP, speaking words and delivering demands and echoing the sentiment of our community. And I've done so with honor, integrity, clarity, courage, and conviction. I still stand behind those words as a leader, but today, Today I stand as a broken-hearted woman, a mother, sister, auntie, friend, confidant, minister, and mentor because of the words I've read, the accounts I've heard, the hands I've held, and the tears I've dried when pain inflicted at the hands of those sworn to protect has risen to an outcry, so silence is no longer an option. I'm a daughter of the village of Harlem, as many of you know by birth. And for eight years now, I've become one of this Auburn, New York by choice. It is this Auburn, New York, where I choose to anchor my business, serve on impactful boards, become a landowner. And it's this Auburn, New York, where I've had the joy of celebrating the first black woman to successfully win the office of city council and to cheer as her story was being made. It is the same Auburn, New York, where my children and my grandchildren come to visit for respite from New York City, gone to camp here, enjoyed community and gifts of comedy, theater, and history. And it is this same Auburn where I've heard the stories of generational trauma caused by incidents of violence against the black and brown community at the hand of law enforcement. And I refuse to believe that healing is not possible, that course correction is not possible, that policy review and overhaul is not possible, that protection, service, and justice for all of us is not possible. We're not deficit in ability. We're not deficit in resources. We're not deficit in tenacity or brilliance. What we are deficit in and what we need to bring to the table is courage and consistent conviction in what must be done now. I was sat, sat here as it was a promise that was made in every oath taker, whether you be a police officer or on the city council, that a promise was made to serve and uphold, a promissory note, if you will. And to those who have issued that promissory note to the good people of this Auburn, I'd like to echo and respectfully use the words of the late Dr. Martin Luther King who says, we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of justice in this city, Auburn, New York. And so we the people have come to cash that note and demand that rights and riches of security and justice happen now and we also come to this hallowed hall to remind you of the fierce urgency of now that you are to do more than listen you are to act 
and so to find in years to come that when the history of 2024, Auburn, New York is read, that you find yourselves on the right side of righteousness. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Pam Kusick. You all know me. I live at 120 Chapman Avenue on the West End. I've come here for three years trying to get help on different issues, one being the police department. I came here two weeks ago asking for two of the council members sitting up there to give me a call in regards to one of these cases of the beatings that recently took place. And I was told by one of the offices, because two of you were in town, that if I didn't have a legal leg in what was going on, to mind my own business. Mind your own business. It's none of your business. When it was put on Channel 9 News that a woman was struck in the face over five times by a police officer, that became my business. So I'm just here to say again, I'm still waiting for that phone call that I've never received for over two weeks again. But this is just par for the course. Because whenever I request help, I never receive phone calls. Half of the time on the West End, I don't know about anybody else here, but when I call for police help, I don't even get the police to- You have to address the body, not the Okay, I don't even get police responding to the calls anymore. And we all know, because we've addressed this before, that I get the response of, if you don't like the way we do the job, then take matters into your own hands. But thank you for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anybody else wishing to be heard? Dr. Hernandez? Good evening, everyone. Week six. Six weeks. Can can you state your name and address for the record, please? Okay, good, then we'll start again. Eli Hernandez, president of the NAACP. Our office is at the Harriet Tubman Memorial MAE Zion Church. Good? Thank you. We have been here for six weeks. Six weeks, an incident took place. We've been here every single day, every single time, And I was here last Thursday, and we walked away hoping, praying, and we come back with two major events. Two. I don't understand. I just do not understand how it is that we have a police department that is expected to protect. So let me make sure everybody understands. We want the police to get home safe. We want them to get to their babies. And we want to get to our babies, too. And there's no reason why that's not happening. There is absolutely no reason why a parent calls the police. The police comes. They beat up the man who called and sends them to the hospital. It is ludicrous. You guys have got to do something. It's all on you. It's under your administration. you got to hold them accountable. There is no reason why this is happening. Please, let's get to work. Come on. Because they're holding back. They're holding back. We're pushing them back to wait so that we can wait for the right process. It's not fair. And I don't know how much longer we can keep them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to be heard? Yes, sir. Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon McCain from 128 North Division Street. I am here just learning that not to address the body, but I'd like to take a couple of seconds out of my three minutes, take a moment of silence for things that have happened. So. Okay, so my name is Brandon McCain. I am here today. It's very nice seeing some familiar faces. Ms. Clarko taught me biology. 
Terry Cuddy. We played pickleball, and at a time, I had a uh, run in with the cops, and Jimmy Giantino came in on a ride along with the cops, and I thought that was, that was nice. I'm here today because I have came against a new thing that's happened. I'm here representing my, I'm here on behalf of my family. We are right next to Falcon Park. We own that house, and I I am here because we are, because I, I made these, we are talking about, in essence, our neighbor next door has decided to move his house, and I have, at a number of times under the past admini administration with Mayor Quill, he has made some offers on our house, and it was never really anything worth taking up, and I decided to stop waiting and put together a plan for the property myself and wanted to pass it by everybody. I talked with my neighbor. He was pretty on board. And I wanted to come here today looking for advancements in zoning is the big part. It's right next door to Falcon Park and just needing some, needing some push to move it from industrial park into residential and I'd like to share this with somebody here today. I sent an email to Mr. Giantino with the presentation. If you'd like to check that out and distribute it at a better time. And oh, uh, did you send it? To James and Giantino at Auburn Gov. I, I sent it 10 minutes ago. I haven't, I haven't received it, but we can get you my correct email address. Oh, okay, absolutely. And yeah, I just wanted to push this out here and get back to some kind of opportunity for Falcon Park, Casey Park, and I'd like to close out with thanking everybody for their time. And is there anybody that I could pass this on to for? Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to be heard? For those, for those of you who are new to a council meeting, um, our rules do not allow us to directly engage with people who come to speak. That's to keep order. Um, typically, we will take notes. We will follow up with people. I know that people have been coming to council, uh, members of the community, for several weeks now um, related to the issues uh, between the community and the police department. I know that there's a feeling, perception, that there's been no response, and I, and I want to address that, um, if it's okay with council. Um, I'll say this, I'm gonna point in my life where there are two basic philosophies that really can help you be successful no matter what the task at hand. First, be a good listener. Being a good listener means you are hearing what the person speaking is saying. Second, be willing to admit when you fall short or if you're just flat out wrong. These two basic principles have served me well, both professionally and personally. Anybody who knows my children will tell you that I've apologized to them for making mistakes as a parent um, more times than I can count. And I, and I think that's one of the things that has made me a successful parent, admitting when you have fallen short. For the last few weeks, members of our, of our community have come to City Council to speak during the public to be heard, related to what they feel is an issue, a serious issue within our community. I have felt throughout this time that we have listened to their concerns, pledged to be transparent and fair to all involved parties, and have offered on multiple occasions an explanation on the process and procedure. In addition, there have been numerous meetings with members of the public related to these incidents, um, specifically with the Human Rights Commission and members of the Human Rights Commission. These responses were provided publicly at city council meetings by the city manager, the second of which was a joint statement that we prepared together. He just read it on my behalf. In my mind, this was the appropriate method because we as a city manager and council form of government and the city manager is responsible for all personnel issues. In my almost nine years of being involved in government, I have not crossed the line of meddling in personnel issues. We collectively have allowed the city manager to do his job and I feel that he has done it well. While I was listening to what the community was saying, I will admit that I was not necessarily hearing what they were saying and as I've said, there is a difference. 
they understandably do not realize how our form of government works. I didn't understand how it worked until I started taking part in it. They voted for us, the five of us, and they were expecting a response from us, specifically me. That's been relayed to me, and I can appreciate that. On this, I have fallen short. I recognize that, I admit it, and I apologize. I've consistently tried to govern in a manner that results in equal and equitable results for all involved, involved parties. This situation is no different. I want our entire community to feel safe and protected, while also feeling as though they are being treated fairly whenever they interact with law enforcement. At the same time, I want and we need our police department to know that they have our support and that we understand and appreciate the difficult tasks they face on a daily basis while giving them the tools to be successful. I believe that it is important that the relationship between the police and the community is one built on mutual respect and trust. I believe wholeheartedly that the last two police chiefs have tried with every ounce of their being to do that. I feel that they've committed themselves to that. And I feel that they've tried to lead the men and women under their command to do the same. They have been present in the entire community and they have worked collectively with their command staff to modernize this department and to prepare it for policing in current times. And we know that it continues to evolve and change as society changes. And I wanna talk a little bit about the work that we've done, so please, please bear with me. In 2020, we underwent the process of Executive Order 2000, or 203, the Collaborative on Police and Community Relations, which was dictated by former Governor Andrew Cuomo. This was a community-wide process, which I participated in as a member of council. Councilor Overstreet Wilson participated in as then a member of the school board. There were many members of this community. There were many public meetings. Uh, there was input taken through surveys. Um, through, and it was during COVID, so there were a lot of Zoom meetings. And what we found at the time is that the Auburn Police Department had done a lot of the things that were, were being proposed by the state. So the foundation had been set, but the work was done. Part of the positive thing that came out of this, in, in my opinion, was a recommendation of the use of body cams, and that has been implemented. This plan was approved by Council Resolution Number 40 of 2021. I view it as a living document. This should be and is reviewed periodically and updated as needed. The department went through the rigorous multi-year process of achieving state accreditation. This means that the department met a set of standards in three categories, administration, training, and operations. Accreditation provides formal recognition that an agency meets or exceeds expectations of quality, demonstrates that the agency performs in a professional manner, has formalized policies in place to govern its operational practices and procedures, and that its employees contribute to the agency's mission and know what is expected of them. Each year, the department undergoes thousands of hours of training. State law mandates 21 hours per officer. Collectively, in 2023, Auburn Police Department officers underwent over 12,000 hours of training. So far in 2024, they've undergone 12,556 hours of training. Some of this is classroom training, some of it is re reality-based physical training. I have personally attended some of this training. It is intense, it is realistic. They use real-life situations that have occurred in the field. They try to learn from those situations. Understanding the importance of training, council has made it a priority to provide funding or training for the police department, even through the most difficult budget years. We recognize that there are serious societal issues such as mental health, homelessness, and addiction, all of which have exasperated due to the COVID pandemic, and that has placed a tremendous strain and burden on all of our first responders, not just the police department. We also recognize it has put a tremendous strain on our community. Often, our first responders are the last line of defense for those in serious crisis and their training does not equip them to handle these situations. As time has gone on, we've tried to provide them the tools to address these situations. Accordingly, we've committed city resources to such initiatives as the Crisis Intervention Team, the Cuba Health Network Outreach Program that addresses the homeless crisis, and Nick's Ride for Friends. Now, I felt it was important to explain what we have done, but I also think it's important to say what we will do. This work continues, the work is not done. The work is never done. It is ongoing. I pledge that to you, this council pledges that to you. We will continue the process of evaluating, modifying, and updating procedures. Training will continue to evolve, it will meet 
and or exceed state standards. We will do our best to continue to provide our first responders with the tools they need to meet the needs of the community. We ask you all to be patient with us, to work with us, to be partners in this work. I feel that in recent years that has been the case. I want to continue that work. I don't want to speak for Chief Slayton, but I think I can. He's, he's in the back of the room. That he is committed to that work as well, that his command staff is committed to that work. Um, I have extended the opportunity to meet to Dr. Hernandez. We tried to do that today. Unfortunately, our schedules did not line up. We're going to try to do that Tuesday. We have met with Reverend Wilson of the Human Rights Commission. Um, he is a valuable and willing partner in this discussion. So please know that we hear you and we want to work collectively and collaboratively to, to address this situation in our community. Thank you. Moving on to the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple things on water quality as we give a weekly update on that. Uh, today's most, the most recent test today have uh, shown that the microcystin level in the raw water at 0 0.03 uh, parts per billion and the finished water is again non-detect as it has been all season. The powder activated carbon system remains in operation. And again, uh, reviewing some opportunities within the city, we'll be offering tests for wastewater treatment plant operator, chief wastewater treatment plant operator, and chief water treatment plant operator. The test will be conducted November 9th, and anyone interested uh, must apply by October 10th. We are also accepting applications for the positions of junior engineer and also a data analyst position. Both are provisional, and no test date has been set yet. Um, since our last meeting here, uh, a variety of city staff have, tour, have toured some of our local homeless sites. We have met with the Cuga County Department of Social Services and this week attended a meeting of the local and regional agencies working to address issues that are leading to homelessness and respond to the impact of the homeless population throughout the city. Um, Few new approaches have been identified and discussed and some barriers have been identified for us to address uh, moving forward. And uh, staff this week also met again with a potential developer of market rate housing to identify programs that may be available to advance that project. That's all I have there. Any questions for Mr. Deigert? Reports from members of council? Yeah. Councilor Robert Street Wilson. I want to first say thank you, Mr. Mayor, for addressing the body for things of the past, the present, and the future. And I also want to say that what I'm about to read is about my lived experiences. I can speak collectively for every person that I represent, but I think it is most important that what is heard comes specifically from me. I view leadership as a living body also. It is not for the faint of heart. It's not a popularity contest, nor it is a name that should be worn on a badge or placed at the top of a word document. In fact, leadership and being in lead can be very lonely. As we were placed into these leadership positions, those that placed us here were not perfect and they knew that we weren't perfect, but they saw that we had the capacity to learn and grow. And they deemed us ready to lead. As a leader, it's not comfortable being placed in a situation where you feel like you are being blamed for everything. When you believe that you're doing the right job, when you believe that you've handled a situation only to discover that the people that you were trying to partner with we're not satisfied with the decision. It is easy to become defensive and defiant. We're human. But those emotions do not absolve us from the responsibility of leading. Many issues have been brought before us. Some our citizens have been happy with how we've addressed them, and others have not been. One such issue brought tonight. For four city council meetings, we have heard about discrimination, intention, race, 
police, and community relations. I can vouch that the decisions to address these concerns have and are being made. However, it appears that the decisions are from a micro view when what the city is experiencing is generational and has a macro umbrella. I'm a black woman that sits on this council. And when I was sworn in, as a part of what I promised, I promised to speak, advocate, and do things that were good for the entire community, even if I was alone. That is why I'm speaking today plainly and blatant. In the past month or so, three African Americans have been the victims of what is being experienced as unwanted excessive force used by members of our police force, one of them being a minor. Sadly, I have to admit that it feels as if our community is in a us against them space, and that is dangerous for everyone. I have lived in Auburn my entire life and often say, we are relatively a safe community to raise your family in, and I still believe that. But what we are addressing today and that behavior is not working because I'm fearful. I have found myself telling my husband, Roy Wilson, and my sons, Jameer and Dewan Wilson, to be careful why they are in this community or driving. I should not have to tell my family to be careful. Maybe this would not be necessary if it was only one incident, but I cannot ignore the fact that it has been three. The trajectory these incidents are on are putting us on a course to be a national story. Auburn will not be a national story. We have an opportunity to heal wounds, mend relationships, and train for a better tomorrow. We need to equip our protectors with the tools necessary to keep themselves safe and the community. The tools they need today are much different than what they needed 5, 10, 15 years ago. It is a failure of leadership if we do not recognize this. I said two meetings back that I was committed to finding and getting the necessary resources our force needs so that they can feel heard and supported. It was said earlier, we want our police officers to feel heard. We want them to get home to their babies, to their families. And we, in turn, want that to be what our reality is as well. We want our community to feel safe and assured that we all have the same goal and we all are working towards it. We all are achieving it. I want to repeat, I can vouch that decisions are being made and are be, have been made and are being made, but they are in a micro view. We have to look at these things from a 40-foot view, and it is macro. They're generational, and they have an umbrella feeling, and they've been a part of our community that we cannot ignore. Auburn is better than this. We're much better than this. And I do thank the council, and I do thank um, the mayor and the rest of leadership for allowing me to say that. But I also want to lastly say, and I'm committed to saying what needs to be said if I say it by myself because I'm already going to be blackballed, so that's OK. So I'm committed to what has to be said for everybody's babies, black, brown, white, dark black, light, light. I want those babies to be safe, too. Thank you. Councilor Cutter. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Overstreet Wilson, um, for sharing this. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, you are being listened to. I do think it is important that, um, that, as the mayor said, meetings do need to happen. But I also agree with Councilor Overstreet Wilson that this is not um, just an Auburn problem. This is um, a problem with this country. And we need to keep that 40-foot perspective as we move forward. So 
I do agree that the meeting needs to happen with um, uh, Dr. Hernandez, and um, we do need to continue to work with the Human Rights Commission. But this um, recent events have put it, put put the issue in a very urgent situation, and um, the public um, needs to know. They do know that we are trying, but I also think it is important that beyond those meetings that we need to articulate how we are going to move forward and we need a time frame so that the public can expect that we are going to solve this problem. So I ask the public, um, and I don't, I know Councilor Street Wilson said be patient, and I don't know if we deserve the patience, and I'll be honest with you. But I want to solve this problem. I know it can be done peacefully. And I know that we moving forward in all aspects of our society should strive for peace. And I'm going to commit to, to coming up with a timeline. And I know in the past we've had community-wide dialogues. And I know in the past we've had more buy-in from uh, the public, and I want to make sure that those kinds of um, those kinds of uh, actions are beginning to happen. And I know that the mayor and the council have the best interest of the public in mind, and we are committed to making sure that the public feels safe and that we can continue our job protecting the public and do a better job. This evening we have a presentation on Green Chips Community Investment Fund. Uh, Ms. Haynes, Director of Planning and Economic Development. Thank you, Mayor and members of Council for having me here tonight to present some information about the Green Chips Community Fund. Just to start with some background, in October of 2022 it was announced that Micron had made a decision to invest up to $100 billion over 20 years in a memory chip fabrication facility in central New York. This investment, the largest in New York State history, includes constructing the country's largest semiconductor megafab. The project is expected to generate 50,000 new jobs. In addition, Micron and New York State have also established the $500 million Green Chips Community Investment Fund over 20 years, and that is focused in the central New York community. A community engagement committee consisting of local stakeholders, um, this committee was co-chaired by Tim Pennard and Melanie Littlejohn of the Central New York Community Foundation. Ms. Littlejohn was just in our community two nights ago. We appreciate her leadership, um, both with the foundation and with this particular effort. Um, this committee involved residents throughout Central New York in identifying community priorities in, education, in areas such as education, workforce development, job opportunities, support for minority women and veteran-owned business enterprises and small businesses, as well as housing, health care, child care, transportation, and infrastructure. Since August 2023, the Community Engagement Committee has gathered community input through various methods aiming to reflect these insights in the Community Priorities document, a community-wide document that can help guide investments beyond just the Green Chips Community Investment Fund. This document um, is on the Central New York Community Engagement Committee. Um, it's some good reading. I encourage everybody to take a look at it. There's also an executive summary for people like me that need to have it distilled down a little bit more. 
Um, as you know, residents of Auburn and Cuga County actively participated in this process, attending public meetings in our community and in Onondaga County, as well as responding to online surveys. Our county was well represented in this process. The community priorities document can be found online, um, as I said, as part of the Central New York Community Engagement Committee's website. There are six priority areas that are outlined um, on the slide. Um, education resources and access, workforce exposure, development and job opportunities, minority women, veteran owned business enterprises and small businesses, housing, community development and quality of place, community health and family supports, and sustainable and equitable, equitable infrastructure development. Out of these priorities, uh, there were some that were identified as immediate priorities, and they are identified by the check marks on this slide. Uh, first is uh, STEAM, literacy and social emotional supports programming into the K-8 education system, create career and workforce readiness and, and opportunities in grades 8 through 12, actively engage high school students and lifelong learners in workforce exposure programs to align their skills with evolving industry needs, strategically develop and expand workforce development and opportunity programs to enhance skill sets, meet industry demands, and foster employment growth, develop and implement workforce support services, actively enhance and support minority women and veteran-owned business enterprises, strategically support and grow the small business support ecosystem, enhance and develop diverse and sustainable housing development initiatives, and strengthen child care and family support initiatives. So these have been identified as immediate priorities as um, informing what needs to be funded first with this community investment fund. So this fund, as I mentioned, is $500 million to be invested over 20 years. Uh, sources of that funding, uh, $250 million from Micron, $100 million from New York State Empire State Development, and $150 million from philanthropy and other partners. Um, the fund that they have, that the state has rolled out right now, the state and Micron in partnership, um, are prioritizing four categories of spending, workforce development, education, community investments, and housing. There's some requirements uh, outlined for the Community Investment Fund. Um, if anybody's interested, I encourage you to um, use the QR code on the slide, um, and you can get more information on the full program. Investments from Empire State Development's portion of the Community Investment Fund will be available for capital-based projects. Empire State Development is the state's economic development agency, and their funding, the $100 million that they are overseeing, uh, will continue to need to meet uh, their um, regulations. Empire State Development will consider grant requests over $100,000. Generally, ESD will not consider funding more than 50% of a pro proposed project. Now that's Empire State Development. The other piece of the funding is from Micron, and they will, um, that portion will be allocated on a case-by-case -case basis with guidance from the community priorities document and in consultation with Empire State Development. So how do we do this? Um, there's two phases uh, for these applications. And I see we have some community partners here um, and hopefully they will um, get in the mix on this process. First is a letter of intent. Um, there's gonna be a single point of entry for all Community Investment Fund project proposals. Um, this is open to the public. Um, these proposals will be, be reviewed by both Empire State Development and Micron, and they will invite relevant projects to submit full applications. I was at um, Regional Economic Development Council meeting two weeks ago. This process opened on August 15th, and they had about 15 applications at the time so far. Phase two is a full application. This is available only by invitation from Empire State Development and or Micron after reviewing a letter of intent. Um, the full application will be submitted via Empire State Development's Consolidated Funding Application Portal, and the Central New York Regional Office of Empire State Development will provide technical assistance if needed. So just a little more detail on the letter of intent. It's a three-page document 
It's a fillable PDF available on Empire State Development website. Again, all of these will be re reviewed by both Empire State Development and Micron. It's my understanding that they will be meeting monthly to see what's come in through the portal. All project proposals must first submit a letter of intent. All letters of intent will be reviewed for alignment with the priorities, principles, and core considerations of the community priorities document. So it's really important to get on the website and take a look at that document if you're interested in applying. Two, consideration of impact on diverse and disadvantaged populations. This particular development is going to be, for lack of a better word, ginormous, um, bigger than anything that we've ever experienced in central New York. Um, so there will be impacts, it's a great thing, a lot of jobs, but there will be impacts on population on our infrastructure. Three, the applicant's ability to execute the project. Do you have experience in doing the kind of programming or the kind of capital project that you're proposing? Project description, that's important. What do you want to do? Uh, select topics addressed and explanation. Alignment with the immediate priorities in the community priorities document. So there's f those four topic areas that I identified earlier. Alignment with principles and core consideration, again, in the community priorities document. It's really gonna be really important to continue to point back to this. And also, when you get in here, if you go on this and, and see what the PDF looks like, you're gonna be, um, they're gonna restrict the amount of words that you use, so you're gonna have to be able to be concise in, in what you're proposing. Leave all the fluffy stuff for the full application. Okay, next, um, last piece of the letter of intent, estimated project costs, grant request, and leverage funding, readiness of the proposed project, outcomes and goals of the project, benefit to diverse and disadvantaged populations, and again, the organization's experience. Again, these letters of intent um, were made available on August 15th. Um, New York State Empire State Development's website has more information about this. Again, there's a QR code if you want to check that out. Also, um, there's a link there for ESD's website. This presentation is on the city's website in the council agenda packet if anybody uh, wants to take a look at it. Again, if Micron or Empire State Development invites you to do a full application, um, this is, you have to submit that through the Consolidated Funding Application Portal. Um, the city has submitted many applications through the CFA portal. I know some of our agencies are very familiar uh, with this as well. Um, but if anybody has a question about how to get in there, we can, we can help you here at the city figure out how to get in there. Um, and that is, in a nutshell, um, there's much more to it. Again, um, many pages of reading to, to get the full story about what uh, the Community Engagement Committee is looking for with the Green Chips funding. Um, the really exciting part of this is the, the partnership between Empire State Development and Micron, where they're not just saying, okay, it's only ESD, you can only do capital projects. You're a human service agency and you've got some great ideas for housing or workforce development or childcare, some of these other areas that they're looking at. That's where Micron comes in and that's where, where they will review those, those kinds of applications. So it's a really great partnership. Really encourage people to take a look at it. Um, any, I, they want, I've been in multiple meetings, they wanna hear any and every idea um, that you know, can, can come from our agencies. Um, as long as it's pointing back to those priority areas, back to this document that we've taken a long time in central New York to put together. Um, so I was hoping to have a state representative here to do this presentation, but you're stuck with me. Um, and if you have any questions, I for sure can uh, get back to you. Um, we have relationships with Empire State Development, who has relationship with Micron, and, we, and we, I know we have people here that have been working with Micron as well. Um, so, any questions, I can um, try to answer them or get back to you. Council, any questions for Ms. Haynes? I, I do have a question. Would you be willing to look at some of that concise language that people might be um, putting together for ideas? Sure, and even better than that, I know that um, Empire State Development staff will be willing to look at that language. 
so I can help anybody get um, you know, to those folks that can help uh, craft that language to the best way to be the most competitive. Anything else? Thank you, Ms. Hayes. Thank you. Other business from the council? <coughs> Hearing none, Mr. Duggan, we have a request for executive session. Yes, I have two matters related to the sale of real property and one matter confidential under attorney client any members of council have anything up? Councilor over Street Wilson? I have one. I um, want to just discuss a attorney client privilege. Yeah. Very good. Do we have a motion for executive session? Councilor Kent, second by Councilor Clark. Oh, please call the roll. Motion for executive session at 6 12 p.m. Councilor Kent? Yes. Councilor Street Wilson? Yes. Councilor Cuddy? Yes. Councilor Clarko? Aye. Mayor Jensen? Aye. We'll be in recess for executive session.